So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kiara Singh, and I'm Institute Development Associate here at the Gene Golding Institute. Welcome to Bristol Data Week 2023, an interactive program of speakers, training and workshops free of charge and open to all that we like to run every year. This will be our sixth Bristol Data Week. Um, so this session would be led by Professor Ian Nabney. In this seminar, Professor Nabney will explore the task of visual analytics from multiple perspectives. So hopefully you'll leave with a greater understanding of the history and applications of data visuals. And um, please do complete our short registration form in the chat box. And um, before we start, I'm just going to run through some housekeeping and the format of the event. Um, so please take a look at our JGI code of conduct that we use at all in-person and online events um, to make sure we have a, a supportive and welcoming, friendly virtual environment for all. Do take a look. And uh, we'll also be recording this event for those who can't attend online today, so be aware of this. Feel free to switch your videos on and off, although it's nice to see some faces, especially when we have a Q&A. Um, and please also keep your microphones muted if you're not presenting or asking a question. Um, if you do have any questions that come to mind throughout the presentation, please put them in the chat box and we will have a break when we can answer some of those um, so I can see who to come to first of all. And yeah, just keep on putting your questions in the chat box and the ones we don't come around to, we will collect um, an answer at the end. And finally, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box with your name and organisation. Um, so those of you who um, may be unfamiliar with the Gene Golding Institute, we're a central hub for data science, artificial intelligence and data intensive research. And we're one of five Bristol Research Institutes. We aim to connect multidisciplinary experts across the university and beyond. For example, we have a seed corn funding scheme, um, which staff and postgraduate students can apply to, to help get projects off the ground and tackle societal challenges. And you can read more about those projects on our website. On the next slide, you can see our institute is named after Jean Golding OBE, who's a mathematician and epidemiologist, renowned as the founder of the Children of the 90s ALSPAC cohort study, which stands for the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children. Um, he's generated more than 2,000 scientific publications, and Jean still works actively at the university today. We're also partners with the Alan Turing Institute. Um, they are based in London and are the UK's National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. And their mission is to make great leaps in research in order to change the world for the better. So here at the JGI, we align with the Turing strategy with these four priority work streams. We work with internal and external partners to develop data-driven solutions to tackle societal challenges. And we also support accessible science and best practice and research, working both within and beyond the university. And we support projects that explore how data is conceptualized and how people imagine, understand and experience data, as well as data science and AI fundamental research. And you can see we do this um, with four cross-cutting activities, such as developing communities through data, so bringing researchers together to tackle complex problems, using complex data sets, um, training and professional development, such as Data Week, which is happening right now. And we also have our Ask JGI Data Science Consultancy Service, um, where we try to help you with any queries you may have. And uh, this includes researchers at all stages of their career. On the next slide, you can see the wide range of activities taking place during Data Week. Um, so we've got seminars in orange, training in blue, workshops in green and social activities in pink. We actually have over 30 activities taking place, a mix of online and in-person events, so please do take note of that. And there's something for everyone, so feel free to sign up for activities um, later on this week. And we'd like to say a big thank you to all our generous sponsors. Without our sponsors, we wouldn't be able to create this week full of exciting offerings that are free and open to all. 
And I just want to highlight one particular event taking place this Thursday at the Brickle, uh, Bristol Beacon, which is in the centre of town and Bristol City Centre. Connect, collaborate, create with data and AI. Um, this is revolving around um, a theme of collaborating with communities using data and I to create more inclusive cultures and you might like to come to our exciting panel discussion with MP Darren Jones, um, you know, get your voice heard, have your opinion shared and uh, we also have a range of inclusive data workshops in the afternoon, um, a complimentary lunch and also um, have a browse of our interactive exhibitions, there'll be some VR exhibits and other things that will be quite hands-on so please do come down to that if you're around the area. And uh, finally, feel free to tweet and share your views using hashtag Bristol Data Week and keep in touch with us. You can connect with us on LinkedIn or subscribe to our mailing list uh, to keep up to date with future events. And if there's anything in particular you'd like to see feature during the next Data Week, please do let us know. We always welcome working with new partners, so do get in touch. And if you have a data science query, please feel free to email ask-jgi at bristol.ac.uk and we will do our best to help you. So um, if you can stop sharing into sir, um, and Ian can share his slides. And without further ado, let me introduce Professor Ian Nabney. Professor Nabney received his PhD degree in mathematics from Cambridge University. He worked as a consultant at Logica Cambridge Limited to 1994 before he joined Aston University. That was in 1995 as a lecturer in mathematics. He was promoted to Professor of Computer Science in 2004. He took on a number of leadership roles in the School of Engineering and Applied Science, including Head of Computer Science, Head of Mathematics, Deputy Dean, Director of the Systems Analytics Research Institute and Executive Dean. In October 2017, he joined the University of Bristol as Head of School. In his research career, he has carried out pattern analysis projects with more than 30 companies in a range of research projects. The REF 2014 impact case study based on his work was included in the 2015 Technopolis report for the Royal Academy of Engineering on the economic returns of engineering research in the UK. These include Rolls-Royce design risk assessment, Pfizer analysis of high throughput screening, Eon energy futures prediction, and a Wheelwright Limited tire pressure measurement. So without further ado, over to you, Professor Nadney. Thank you, Chiara. Just to check the screen, the screen is showing my uh, slide, first slide, I hope. That's Good. right. Yes, we can see it. Good. So I'm well aware that listening to one person talk for, uh, for an hour is, is a lot to ask. So that's why I'm suggesting that if you do have questions, please do put them in the chat. And, and about halfway through, I'll take a break and we can perhaps answer some of them then. And then you'll have another chance at the very end of the talk as well. So the purpose of this talk is really to give you a, a sort of first view of what data visualization can do for analysis, and also to show you some of the, the, if you like, very attractive features of it in terms of what you can see and how you can represent data. Now I can't move on to the next slide. There we go. Right. So it's been said that a picture is worth a thousand words but that's only true if it's designed in the right way we can use visual representations of data to help people to carry out tasks more effectively and we present data in a human readable way so that people can take action so the important things to take from that are the fact that we're doing this for a purpose we're not just doing it to make a picture and that the purpose uh, is to help people make actions, to, to do things in the real world. And so the visualization has to be representative of the data, but also to support human inference from that data to, to understand it better. So I'll talk a bit about why we visualize data. I'll talk a bit about how we can visualize data. I'll talk about the link between data visualization and machine learning and, and, and data science, and then do some case studies as well. Okay. So visualization uh, allows people to analyze data when they don't know exactly what the questions are in advance. And the point here is that 
standard, if you like, statistical analysis tends to be based around the idea that you have a hypothesis and that you can then test that hypothesis in some way by building a model or by doing a significance test. Whereas the purpose of visualization really is primarily to support exploration of data, generation of new hypotheses. And the advantage is that refinement, refinement of our understanding, takes place at speed as we actively scan a visual representation of data. In effect, what we're doing is we're offloading our internal cognition and memory to the visual perceptual system. In other words, away from the conscious part of our uh, analysis of data. And that's effective because almost half of the brain is devoted to the visual sense. So in other words, we're offloading uh, so a very limited resource, which is cognition and memory, and taking a lot of that computation and moving it to the visual perceptual system, which is a huge part of our brain. And visualization is particularly helpful for users who are not specialists in data modeling. So that's most of the world. Uh, if we want to detect outliers, we want to look for clusters or segmentation, if we want to understand the features in our data, or simply to get feedback on the results of our analysis, seeing what we're doing, all of these tasks, visualization can play a part in. And there are two main aspects that, that I in particular work on. One is information visualization, which I'm gonna talk about for most of the talk, but I'll also talk a bit about data projection, which is where the machine learning comes in. And the data projection is the data science, machine learning part of this, where uh, the point here is we're trying to take high dimensional data and project it to a lower dimensional space, usually two dimensions, that we can then visualize and interact with. But we try and do that so that we preserve as much of the structure of the data that we had originally as possible. And I'll discuss that in more detail a bit later on. So um, a little history. So maps, which are a way of visualizing data, have been around for a very long time. So. We know that many uh, older cultures uh, in China, Roman cultures, Greek cultures, and so on, all had ver ver versions of maps where we take the geographic coordinates and uh, we then display uh, places or paths between those places uh, in, a, in a visual way. However, the invention of data graphics to replace map coordinates with more abstract variables is actually surprisingly late and a surprisingly big step. So it was taken in the late 18th century. Uh, a German by the name of Johann Heinrich Lambert in 1765 and William Playfer, who I think was Scottish, um, who invented the line graph, were the people who made that step. And the plot at the bottom of this screen is one of Playfair's graphs. So he was an economist and he, was, he wrote a book about uh, the economies of Europe and um, the way they interacted over time. And this is the typical graph that he produced. So it shows uh, years along the x-axis and uh, amounts of money, I think millions of pounds on the, the y-axis. And it shows exports and imports to and from Denmark and Norway from England or the UK uh, between 1700 at the left-hand end and 1780 at the right-hand end. So. The red line is exports from the, from the UK, and the yellow line is imports to the two countries, Denmark and Norway, from the UK. And this graph very clearly demonstrates uh, the balance of trade. So he's colored in this pink area here is when the balance of trade is against the UK. It's importing more than it's exporting from Denmark and Norway. And then the, the pale brown part here is when the balance is in favor of the UK, i.e. we're exporting more than we're importing. And this graph is a, is a fantastic example of how we can gain insight into data and build hypotheses because um, from the visualization, because we can see here that there's a crossing point. There's a crossing point in roughly, it's between 1750 and 1760, where there's a sudden increase in the value of the exports from the UK, whereas the imports are staying roughly stationary. So the immediate question is, what changed in 1755 or so? And of course, the answer is the Industrial Revolution. 
started around then in the UK. And suddenly we were producing in the UK much more high value goods that were in demand across Europe and we were exporting them, whereas they, we were importing typically um, raw materials and the value of that did not change nearly so much. So this, of course, was a major step forward at the time. And indeed it took, I think uh, in the book, there's quite a long explanation from Playfair as to how to read these graphs because they were totally new things. This idea of putting not um, longitude and latitude on the two axes of the graph, but to put uh, a time and uh, a, an amount of money uh, on the on the y axis, on the x and y axis, um, and this is despite Descartes, who invented Cartesian coordinates, are named after him. Uh, in the early 1600s, it took another 150 years for anyone to think about why don't we put those those more abstract coordinates as axes on a graph. But there's more to visualization than graphs. And here are just two of many other uh, possible visualization techniques that, uh, that may be of interest. Uh, so here we have something called a word cloud. Um, this was available online a few years ago, wordle.net. I, th I think it's probably gone now, that particular site. What it does is it takes a piece of text, it counts the frequency of various words in it, and then it produces a display of all those words where the size of each word is dependent, related directly to the frequency of the word in that piece of text. So here we have a piece of text taken from Primo Levi's novel, If This Is a Man, and uh, the word one turns up a lot, but there's a lot about man, human, understand, life and time, must. So these are the key words in that piece of text. Or we might want to visualize a network, and here we have a graphic representing, a 2D graphic representing connections between uh, journal papers in different parts of the scientific literature. And from this, we can discern uh, which are the, um, where the strongest connections are between different disciplines in scientific research, where a connection is, to, is uh, based on a cross-reference or a citation of one paper from another. And so, we can see that uh, you know, maths and physics here are strongly connected to electronic engineering, sorry, electrical engineering and computer science, um, and also to chemical um, uh, chemistry, uh, digital chemistry, which is connected in turn to earth sciences and biology, and so on through to disease and, and, and so on. So these two graphics are, are definitely not line graphs, but they do provide insight into uh, large scale and complex data. But in addition to pictures, um, modern computer graphics gives us the ability to actually change the view that we have. So much of research in this area has been based around printed graphs, printed visualizations of data. And of course, more recently, uh, the rise of computer graphics has enabled us to interact with a graphic. And that's a key benefit of using computer graphics over print. And I'll give some examples a bit later on in, in, the, in, the, in, this, in this session. Now, there are a number of ways you might do that. We might have um, a graph changing over time. We might want to be able to select data points in that graph. But we also might want to navigate around a complex visualization or indeed change what we see. Now, all of these techniques add functionality, but they must be done with great care to get the full benefit. And this also relates to managing multiple linked views and, and reducing items and attributes. And as I said, I'll give you some examples of this a bit later on. So the question really is, with all these automated forms of analysis that we have available now, why have a human in the loop at all? So the important thing, as I've alluded to already, is that visualization, or viz, as people in the field often call it, allows people to analyze data when they don't know exactly what questions they need to know in advance. Many analysis problems are actually very ill-specified and the question refinement takes place as part of the feedback. They can also be used as part of a transition to a, 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 a full solution. So as a way of understanding requirements for a computational solution or to refine a computational solution or to check an automated system. But also they can be useful in the longer term, not just um, at the start of a project, Often exploratory analysis is part of the scientific process. So for example, on the right-hand side here, 
we have some visualization tools that are used in understanding uh, biological systems, and in particular, the actions of proteins and their links with genomics. And so large-scale visualization systems often form part of any discovery process, particularly in science or engineering. But why depend on vision? We have other senses as well. Well, as I said already, half the brain is devoted to the visual sense. So it's a fantastic computational resource in that sense. Uh, and active vision, the, the way we actually look at things and understand them, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment, means that we should think about graphic designs and visualization as cognitive tools, enhancing and extending our brains. And we should design our visualization systems to take advantage of the visual system and the way that it works. So the first point about that is that a very significant amount of visual information processing occurs in parallel at the pre-conscious level, and we're leveraging this. So we're leveraging what we'll, we'll see in a moment is all the, example, for example, feature extraction techniques that go on in the brain automatically with uh, hundreds of millions of nerve cells in parallel doing it. But there are limitations of visual systems. So we have the illusion that we see the world in detail and completely all at once. In fact, the brain grabs just those fragments of the visual uh, information that it gets to execute the current mental activity. And we'll explain how that works in practice a bit later on. So what about other uh, sensory systems that we have? Well, sound is poorly suited to representing data because it's a sequential stream. So it relies on, on memory. Um, those of you that enjoy classical music like I do will know of the, the power that great composers like Beethoven use about our memory and the way we, we appreciate things over time, but it's, it's not a great way to analyze data. Taste and smell don't have viable recording and reproduction technology, so um, they're fundamentally unsuited to representing data. And haptic devices, i.e. touch, uh, only provide a very limited dynamic range. So in other words, they don't provide the sort of level of detail that we can get from the visual system. So sight it is. But why show the data in detail? We often have ways of summarizing data. What's the, the value of some, uh, showing the data in detail? Well, here's a very simple example, a very famous example. Um, uh, a, a guy called Anscombe wrote, uh, created a quartet of very small data sets. Each of them contains one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 data points. And each of them looks very different. So there's each of them is, is a two dimensional data set with variables X and Y. And these four graphs show those two dimensional uh, data sets in full. But each of these data sets have the same mean, the same variance, and correlation between the two variables. So if I were to simply quote, the mean variance and correlation of the data set, you would not know which of these four uh, data sets actually was the cause of that, those summary statistics. If you want to go even further, if you allow more data points, Alberto Cairo produced a data, two-dimensional data set which looks like a dinosaur, which also has the same mean variance and correlation as the four original data sets there. So the bottom line is that summary statistics can be extremely misleading. So, uh, for example, this first data set is a roughly linearly correlated data with a degree of noise about the linear correlation line here, which is given in the gray. The second data set is very clearly nonlinearly related data. So, y is clearly a, a nonlinear function of x, but still has the same uh, linear regression line through it. The third data set is a data set where we have one outlier, but the actual data clearly lies on a shallower gradient linear uh, line, straight line. And then the fourth data set has all the X values in one place apart from one, and they're clustered around this line. So again, it has the same mean variance and, co and correlation for both the two variables as the all three other examples. So summary statistics can be very misleading, if I told you the summary statistics, it could be any one of these four these four data sets, or indeed our friend the Anscombe Osaurus, uh, to coin a phrase. So, how do we go about designing visualization systems? 
why, sh why should we do that? Well, analysis of systems can help improve our design, but also more importantly, helps you to think about design choices systematically. And that's important because there are lots of ways of showing data. And we want to make sure that the way we show the data takes advantage of our human, human visual system, but also represents the data fairly so that we draw um, reasonable inferences from it. So we need to understand what the date, what data the user sees. We need to understand why the user is using a visualization tool. So that what the data sees, that's the sort of the, the data analysis, the, sorry, the data abstraction, what, what the types of data are, what the variables are and how they're, they're related. The why the user is using a visualization tool is all about task analysis. What are the tasks that the user needs to carry out when looking at this data? And then the how part is, well, how do we actually show the data that, the, that we have available to enable the user to carry out those tasks? How do we encode the data and how do we uh, develop the interaction that enables the user to actually understand the data and answer their queries? So um, someone called uh, Tamara Munzner, who is a, a professor at the University of British Columbia, has produced a, a really wonderful a taxonomy of the way that we interact with data and the way we visualize data. I'm not going to go through the details on this slide, but basically say that there is a, a taxonomy of, of a way of, of categorizing the sorts of tasks that people want to do and enable us then to think about how we how we analyze those tasks, sorry, how we take data and help users to carry out those tasks. So for example, um, they may want to search for some data. And if the target is not known, but the location is known, they want to browse in a particular region of the data set to enable them to understand, to find that particular target, and so on. So one of the key guiding principles of um, information visualization is, is Schneiderman's mantra, which is to overview first, to zoom and filter to enable the user to, to, to zoom in on bits of interest, either zooming in visually or filtering out uh, things that they don't need to see, and providing details on demand by uh, providing local information. So broadly speaking, produce, search, and query correspond to the three parts of Schneiderman's mantra. So um, we have our first pausing point in the, in the talk. I'm going to set you a little task, and once we've done this, perhaps I can take a few questions. So this is a, a task involving ECG analysis. So I was working with a, a small company called Cardionetics, who produced a, a box here which measures your um, the electrical impulses in your heart. So we have three electrodes attached to the chest. Uh, I have to say, unfortunately, this is not me when I was younger. It's a it's a, a model. Uh, rather than me in my former uh, former beauty. Um, and this box here measures every single heartbeat over a 24 hour period. So it measures, that's roughly 90,000 heartbeats. It takes each heartbeat, it segments that into different timings and different heights. So the P, Q, R, S, T and U complexes, and it measures different time intervals to create a data set where we have about 13 dimensions. 13 variables that are measured from each heartbeat. And what we then do is using some of the techniques I'm going to talk about later on, I projected this data down to two dimensions using a, a nonlinear technique. So the axes here don't have any interpretation, but what does have an interpretation are the data points and the distances between them. So uh, I've color coded the data points by the type of heartbeat. So blue is a sinus rhythm, that's a normal a healthy heartbeat, green is one sort of ventricular ectopic heartbeat, and the red crosses are a different sort of ventricular ectopic heartbeat. So uh, these are bad heartbeats, these are like unhealthy ones. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to pause for a moment and uh, ask you to, to um, type into the chat what you think we can learn from this graphic about the data.
Okay. So two very good points here, um, which are different from the ones I was uh, I was after. So the axes have no interpretation. They're simply a way of presenting the data in two dimensions. Uh, the point about red and green is a very good point. They are actually also different shapes as well. So the green ones are diamond shapes and the red ones are cross shapes. So the data's got three clustered groups. Yep, major heartbeats were normal. Yeah, so what I will do now is I will um, uh, just sort of give a bit of an interpretation here. Um, so the first thing that we see is, yes, there are three strongly clustered uh, sets of data points. Now, that's very good news because what we'd like to be able to do is we'd like to be able to classify heartbeats based on the, on the, the variables that we've measured. And this two-dimensional representation of the data says at least providing we use a nonlinear model, it's likely that we should be able to get very good separation between the classes. We should be able to classify very accurately these three different classes of heartbeat. So what that means is we have a potential for building a very accurate diagnostic system here because we can uh, build a model that is going to separate out the various types of heartbeat very accurately. We can also see that we have some data points that are outliers, that are unusual. So we have um, a blue point here, you have three green points here, and then a slightly larger number of red points, which are further away from the, the, the body, main body of the red points. These are what we would call outliers, and they're unusual data points. Um, and it's important to understand what they, that they're there and to perhaps understand what they are. We might want to bring up the uh, ECG traces for those heartbeats to actually investigate what are they caused by? Is it caused by uh, muscle artifacts, someone moving their arms so that the chest muscles are, are changing and that is distorting the, the, the heartbeat? Are they, just, are they caused by um, uh, one of the electrodes not having a very good contact and therefore getting some extra noise into it? Has someone moved too close to a, a plug where we have 50 hertz mains frequency going that's being picked up by our sensors? all sorts of reasons for why these might be a problem. And in each case, we want to understand the reason and uh, perhaps build in additional uh, filtering techniques to, to remove those particular problems. The point being that we have about 13,000 data points here, and this visualization has very quickly enabled us to find some potentially problematic heartbeats. Uh, and finally, we see there's a little bit of overlap between some of these clusters. And again, those data points are worth investigating in more detail. Have they been wrongly classified, for example? So all of these, these heartbeats were classified by hand. People make mistakes. Have they made a mistake with some of these heartbeats? Or are there genuinely some heartbeats which are sinus rhythm that look like ventricular ectopic ones and so on? So I think the important point to, to learn from this is that at the cost of about three or four minutes of, of training the model that did this data projection, we've got a great deal more insight into the data than we could possibly have got from a spreadsheet of 13,000 rows and 13 columns. Just imagine trying to understand, um, to understand that with just from a spreadsheet. And the second thing to, to bear in mind is that none of us on the call, as far as I know, are experts in cardiology. And yet we've got some insight into the data despite that, because we've been able to present it in a way that enables people who are not experts in cardiology or indeed in statistics necessarily to get a better understanding of that data set. So I'll just pause there to see if there are any other questions about what we've been talking about so far. Uh, I did Kiara. one question, Ian, from... Yep. Freddie Turner asking, what was the name of that taxonomy? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Freddie, but uh, did you mean the one that had browsing as an example? Was, was it Tamara or something? Is that right? Tamara, Tamara Munzner is the name of the person. Um, I can write that into the chat. Um, I can provide some references later. That's Great. Well. Yeah. 
And uh, I think Syed has also asked, uh, please, could you show a slide before this ECG one briefly? Um, Syed, did you want to come on and... and... Hang on a moment, I'm just struggling to get it to work again. Yeah, there we no go, problem. yeah. Okay. And does anyone else have any questions? Uh, feel free to raise your hand or put them in the chat box. Okay, thanks Ian, that's fine. Okay, yeah. jolly good. Uh, we will hopefully move on. Right, so, um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time now talking about psychophysics, which is the if you like, the physics of our perception and the way that we um, process that perception in our brains. So we have the impression that we see the world vividly, completely and in detail, but this impression is completely wrong. At any given instant, we apprehend only a tiny amount of the information in our surroundings, but it's usually just the right information to carry us through the task of the moment. Keeping a, a copy of the world in our brains would be a huge waste of cognitive resources. It's much more efficient to see only what we attend to and only to attend to what we need. But our illusory impression that we're constantly aware of everything that happens because our brains uh, arrange for our eye movements to occur and relevant information to be picked up just as we turn our attention to something we need. So before the ability to measure brain signals and to measure what was going on in the brain, we had a very different model of perception. We did have this view that we everything just came into us, we had a picture of the world, but we now have a profoundly different model of perception, which is far more accurately based on the way that our brains actually work. So visual thinking consists of a series of acts of attention, i.e. focusing our eyes on part of the visual field, driving eye movements, and tuning our pattern finding circuits. And these acts of attention are called visual queries. Understanding how they work can make us better designers. So here are a couple of graphics. And here we have on the left-hand side a bar chart, um, a number of different fruits, apples, oranges, bananas, and pears. And then we have a, a this is purely synthetic data, it's not real data. We have a value of imports into a country um, given by the heart of, height of each bar. So if you're given the task of finding which kind of fruit import is the largest by dollar value or by value, yes, by value, we make visual queries. And the visual query that personally, that personally I make is I start across from the, the left-hand side, I look across at the height of each bar, and I notice how my eyes move up and down to encompass each one. And from that, I determine that the highest bar is this one here. And then I look down to read the word at the bottom, which is bananas. So that tells me that bananas is the fruit import, which is the largest by dollar value. And I notice I talked about a whole sequence of uh, acts of attention, places that I looked, things that I looked at, uh, and also cognitive things that I did, thinking that I did uh, in response to that. The way you view it might work slightly differently, but it will encompass, it will consist of a series of acts of attention. If we look here, um, let's suppose we were set the task of finding the fastest route from Calais to Toulouse, where here gray lines denote minor roads and orange lines denote major roads. How do we go about doing that? Well, we know that Calais is in the top, the north end of France. Uh, if you know about, about the French, French geography, um, you can find Toulouse down in the southwest fairly quickly. And then we, given those two cities, we sort of scan along the various lines using the orange lines as the places that we look to find out the shortest route. So we probably scan this route through Rouen and the direct route from Calais to Paris, uh, because we know we want to go roughly southwest and perhaps decide that the one through Rouen is, is shorter. And then we would look at this route down the west part of France and this route further east and decide that, roughly speaking, given the amount of time we spent scanning, that this western route is the shorter route between those two points. So what we look at is therefore very strongly driven by what we're trying to do. We're trying to find 
we need to find the start and end point, and then we need to try and find the shortest route between. We don't look at most of the rest of the map. Having said that, although the way we do the visual queries is based very much on the task, it is also inflected by personal knowledge. So um, I do this, this uh, part of this lecture to my MSc students, and the majority of those students are from outside of the, come from originally from outside the UK, in fact, from outside of Europe. So from many of them from India or China or uh, Malaysia or whatever. And for them, the first task, part of the task, which is finding Calais and Toulouse on the map, is itself a complex visual query because they don't know French geography very well. Indeed, why should they? And so they actually have to do a much more systematic scan of the whole image to first of all find Calais, which is relatively easy if you start from the top, and then to find Toulouse, which takes scanning most of the image until you find it. So we need to take account of the way that we look, which is fairly consistent across different people, but also our prior knowledge, which of course will be very different for different users. And that's all part of the design process. So why do we only look at one part of the visual field at a time? Well, the, the answer to that is that that's actually uh, comes from the way our retinas and the way uh, work and the way that we process information in those retinas. The fact is that the sensors uh, for light in our retinas are not evenly distributed. They're very much packed around the center and then much more widely dispersed across the rest of the image. Right, across the rest of the retina. So each retina, you like, has some fields in the brain which, which it, it, it uh, communicates with directly. And those, if you like, brain pixels, parts of the brain that are looking at parts of the image, vary enormously in size over the visual field. And that reflects the differing amounts of neural processing power devoted to different regions of visual space. So at the edge of the visual field out here, we can only barely see something the size of a fist held at arm's length. So again, I, I give as an exercise to people to, to look front and hold their arm out to, their, to the side and to be honest about what they can actually see. And yes, you can see that there's a fist, but if there's a, it, you know, how many fingers there are in the fist, you can't actually see. So you have a very vague understanding of what's going on at that point. Whereas, um, over half our visual processing power is concentrated in the, the paraphavia, the small part in the very uh, center of the field of view. And we can resolve about 100 points on the head of a pin held at arm's length if we're looking straight forward and we're looking straight at that pin in the favea. So the fact is that we must remember, therefore, that for refined judgments, we must expect the eye to move. The eye cannot uh, look at, understand or see, and our brain certainly can't understand, fine details anywhere other than the center of the visual field. And therefore, to get an understanding of, for example, the relationship between details in the, in the view, we have to move our eyes. That's essential. So, that's less than 5% of the visual world. So we've got half our visual brain power directed to processing less than 5% of the visual world. So you can see that if we had um, if we had the same density of visual processing power for the whole visual field, we would need to make our brains 10 times bigger. Half of the brain, 20 times bigger, half of the brain is 10 times bigger the brain. It's very hard to see how that would be actually biologically possible uh, given our head size or without making our head 10 times bigger, which would clearly have lots of disadvantages, particularly when you were being born. So that's why we have to move our eyes. It's the only way we can direct our brain power where it's most useful. So actually there are very strong eye muscles attached to each eyeball and they rotate it very rapidly so that different parts of the visual world become imaged on the central high resolution fovea. These muscles accelerate the eyeball at an angular velocity of up to 900 degrees per second. So that's three revolutions per second. Then they stop it all in less than one tenth of a second. So during one of these so-called saccadic eye movements, vision is suppressed 
uh, and we have our very, very sophisticated brain function that gives you the illusion that, that it's not being suppressed, but it actually is. And controlling these eye movements is a key part of the skill of seeing, and our cognitive processes, our understanding of the task, will be a large part of driving those eye movements. So that's important. We're gonna be looking around the, the visualization that we, we have in front of us. The second important fundamental principle is that the human perceptual system is fundamentally based on relative judgments, not absolute ones. That's Weber's law. So um, if I can give it another musical example, as I'm fond of music, um, virtually, well, virtually anyone with any musical sense whatsoever can tell the difference between two pitches. They can tell um, the, uh, the, the interval between two pitches. Or if they're played together, they can, they can tell you what the, that interval is. However, very few people, comparatively speaking, have absolute pitch, can tell you, given a note that's played, what the actual note is. Sorry, a sound that's played, they can tell you what the note is. That's a much rarer thing. So many people can do relative judgments, very few people can do absolute ones. So for example, the amount of length difference that we can detect is a percentage of the object's length. So um, being able to tell the relative difference in length is really important, for example, to, to judge differences in length. So if we look at these three examples here, <clears throat> we have A and B, we have a block that represents different values. And uh, in each case, the length of the block is what is, uh, what is the, that represents the value. And we want to judge whether A or B has the bigger value. So we can present that data in three different ways. We can present the data here where we just have the two boxes. They're not aligned, they're not framed, they're just two boxes. We can uh, present the data uh, here where we have, the, they're not aligned, so they're not lined up, but we do have a box. So the, the framing around this has the same length in each case. That's given by this black line around the blue box. And here we have, you know, like a standard bar chart, we have the, the boxes are not framed, but they are aligned to have the same lower point. So for each one, when we look at it, we can ask the question, uh, which is the longer one, A or B, but also ask the question, how long does it take us to make that judgment? So I'll just pause for a moment for you to think about that in each case, which is the a larger value, A or B, and how long does it take you to reach that, that judgment? So the answer is that, well, they're all the same. The answer is that A is bigger than B, but it takes longer to make that judgment in the first representation than it does in the second, than it does in the third. So why, why is that? How can we use what we just learned about eye movements to, um, to understand why that might be? Well, I'll go, go about these in the opposite order. So here, because A and B are aligned, we don't need to look at the bottom of the boxes. We simply need to look at the top of the boxes and see which one is higher in the image. So our eye movement would start here and go across and, ah, oh, well, we can see that going from A to B is going down. Relatively straightforward. Here, in the second representation, what I would argue here is that the, way the, the reason the framing helps uh, compared to the first representation is that the relative difference in the white space is bigger than the relative difference in the blue space. The relative difference between A and B, as you can see from here, is relatively small. It's perhaps a tenth, 10%. 10 Whereas because the, the white areas are smaller, shorter, the relative difference between them is bigger. So it's, relative, it's easier, I think, to see here that this white space is bigger than this white space. And therefore, the blue area is bigger for A than for B but it's still a bit of a challenge. We still look at the top of the boxes and the bottom of the boxes. 
And that involves looking at both, uh, making a judgment as to that this step up here is bigger than that step up there, which requires our working memory as well as just looking. And that is a bit bigger challenge than it was for the, the third representation. And here, well, we have the same challenge, but the diff because the relative difference is smaller, it's even harder. We look at this difference, we look at this distance. Probably, actually, when you do it, you might check back and forth a couple of times just to verify your, that you're, you're making the right judgment. And that's because we're having to look actively around the image to many more places in A than in B and in B than in C. So what that tells us is try and minimize the number of eye movements people need to make to make a judgment about that they need to do to complete their task. So this is what's actually going on when we're perceiving things in an image. And this is sort of the fundamental slide of the whole talk, uh, certainly in terms of the psychophysics part of it. So we have our visual field at the back of the retina. In the brain, what happens is that features are processed in parallel from every part of the visual field, and millions of them are processed simultaneously. So we have feature extraction uh, neurons that are looking for horizontal edges, that are looking for vertical edges, that are looking for slanted edges, that are looking for color contrast, that are looking for motion, a range of different features that are being searched for. Separate feature detectors are attached to separate parts of the visual field, and they're all running in parallel. So although each neuron is relatively slow, we've got millions of feature extraction devices running at the same time. The next stage in the processing of what we see is to build up patterns. And that is done by looking for close together features that are similar, but mean there's something bigger than just one neuron firing. So a line consists of a whole set of edges. Uh, a region consists of a whole set of perhaps color or texture of features going off at the same time. And our attentional tuning, which is the top-down process, I know what task I'm trying to do, reinforces those which are most relevant. So if I know I'm looking for a tomato, then a red region will attract my attention a lot more than a region which is a different color. And finally, we put together these patterns based on the features into objects. And the ones that are most relevant to the task at hand are held in visual working memory. And supposedly only between one and three objects are held at any instant. But also objects can have both visual and non-visual attributes. So if I see an outline of a dog, I will, offer, I will actually attach in my brain the, the, the concept of dog to it because that helps me identify it and uh, remember it. But also along with dog will come a whole set of if you like uh, additional features in my thought processes that go with it. So the process is driven from the bottom up from building up our understanding of features in the image, but also top down where our, the, pro the attention that we're tr trying to pay, they reinforce relevant information. So there are a number of different ways that we can represent uh, data through different, um, different sorts of measures. And there's a power law of perception. So there's a power law of the sensation S and the physical intensity. Um, the, our sensation of that intensity is related to that intensity to a power of N. Um, and we want to use measures where N is close to one because that means that the sensation of the, um, of the physical uh, uh, measurement is close, very close to the actual measurement or the actual um, impulse that was there. So this shows the physical intensity of what we have against the perceived sensation and uh, a straight line where the power is one is the ideal that our perceived sensation matches precisely the physical intensity. And for length, we do have that magic number. We do have that that power law is one. Um, for area or for depth, actually, 
as the, so in, the intensity grows, we underestimate the importance of it. So we underestimate area. The power law here is 0.7. For the brightness of a particular area, we significantly underestimate at higher intensities. It's only a power law of a half square root. Whereas for saturation of color, that we overly emphasize that. We overly perceive that as a power law of 1.7. So where possible, we should use length as our way of representing data rather than area or brightness of color because we perceive that much more accurately. And there have been some experiments done with people uh, to, to you know, compare two values and see how well they accurately they can, they can understand them. And the most accurate thing to have is a line position against a common scale, i.e. much like that bar chart that we showed on the previous slide. The next one is unlined position against an identical scale, then abstract length by itself, then angle, and then area. But area is much less accurate than all of the other ones we've got there. So that means that when we're designing our interface, we should use these top, um, what are called channels, methods of representing the data wherever possible, and use other ones uh, only where we've if like, run out of, of more accurate methods to use. And that's important when we're representing multiple variables at the same time, we're going to try and use the most accurate representations for the most important variables, and then use other, other ways of representing other channels for um, different variables. Okay, so that's how we perceive things. How, how can we use this sort of thing in practice? Well, I'm going to use some, some nice historical examples to sort of show you how um, you can use these sorts of representations to help people to take action. And the first one is uh, a very famous example. It's a, a cholera map produced by John Snow. So in 1854, there was a cholera outbreak in London's Broad Street region. So this is the, the West End of London. So here we have Regent Street, which was a very rich and very expensive street, lots of shops on it not very far away, as was the way in Victorian London, we have a slum area where people were living in very overcrowded uh, uh, dwellings. And John Snow was a, a medic uh, doctor working in the, in the region. And um, he, he, he created two maps, and this is a version of the first one of those, December 1854. And it shows a geographic map of the the low, the um, sorry, the, the neighborhood, and the little black dots or bars that you can see represent deaths in particular households. So each one is located uh, at a particular place where there was a house, and the the num the the height of that bar is the number of deaths in that location. And there's also noted on the map uh, a black circle for each of the pumps for the local water system. So there's a pump here, there's a pump here, and so on, a uh, pump down here. And what you can notice from this graph is that there's a significant de higher density of deaths from cholera in this region here. There are more deaths going on in, in further away places. There's one here. There are a few scattered around here, but there's a much higher density uh, around this region here in the middle of the slum. And John Snow's hypothesis was that it wasn't miasma, it wasn't air transmission of cholera that was a problem, it was in the water. And so he decided that this pump here was the cause of that cholera outbreak. So to stop people using the pump, he did this very simple thing. He took the handle away. And after the handle was removed, the, the incidence of cholera went right down and uh, it was it was diminished. Uh, you know, they got on top of the, the outbreak and people returned to, to, to good health after that point. So this map enabled him to convince skeptical medics of the time that actually waterborne transmission was critical here. And indeed, they found out when they dug out the well that there was um, uh, infiltration from the sewage system that was causing this particular problem. There's a, a very sad story that goes with this, um, which de absolutely demonstrates the waterborne transmission of cholera, which is that there was someone who died from the same outbreak of cholera who was living in Hampstead, which is 
uh, about five or six miles away from this up in North London. It was a, a village on the outskirts of London at the time and was a place which was known for its healthy air and, and so on. This person had originally originally lived in this region of London, and they so enjoyed the taste of the water that they had bottles of the water from that particular pump uh, taken up to them every week uh, in their Hampstead home. And of course, they drank the infected water and died of cholera. And there was, if you like, another proof that it was waterborne transmission because this person had no connection to this location apart from the water that they were being sent. But anyway, the visualization helps to make the case and win over people to the argument that waterborne transmission is really important in cholera. Um, so it's a really good example of visualization of public health. This is perhaps a clearer redrawn modern example. So it shows the pumps with the P and it shows the number of cases uh, uh, by these dots. There are other ways in which visualization has been used for, for good. Um, I promised I wouldn't use a, an animation, but uh, if you follow the links in the, in the, um, in the slides that will be circulated later or go to gapminder.org, Hans Rosling, who's unfortunately no longer with us, was a great exponent of dynamic scatter plots with additional attributes and their application to public health. So this uh, chart here, let me see if I can at least show it to you, even if I don't run it. So hang on a moment. Yes, go ahead and run it if you need to, Ian. It just might not have any sound, but that I oh, think... Oh, well, the sound's not a problem. Okay. So this is a, a chart that shows um, a lot of things. So I'll just explain briefly what they are. So the x-axis is um, GDP per capita, um, and it runs um, with purchasing power parity, so to take account of different prices of cost of living in different places, um, adjusted to be... To be like that, and also inflation adjusted. So it doesn't take account of inflate. Well, inflation is no longer an issue. On the right hand, on the left, the y axis, we have life expectancy at birth. So it runs from 10 up to 90. And here we have all the different countries in the world. The size of the bubble is the population size at that particular time. We have each year is done separately. So this is 2022. And it shows the uh, link between uh, income in each country and life expectancy. And as you can see, there's a positive correlation between the two. The color coding tells you which region of the world that the country is drawn from. But also, he shows how um, this varies over time. So if I click on start, we start from roughly 1800, we can see a number of things, all the circles are a lot smaller. So uh, all the countries had a much lower population. They're much more clustered at a lower income level. So the world was a poorer place, but most clearly the life expectancy is much smaller. So the average life expectancy is somewhere around 30 at birth. We can run this through and we see some countries moving around very quickly. Sometimes it's because of missing data, but very often, it's because of major events, typically wars, uh, outbreaks of disease, pandemics, or famines. So I've run this on a little bit further. So there was a dip down there for India. So it was clearly a, a like a probably a, a, a cholera outbreak, I think, at that point. We run it on, things bouncing around, another dip for India. China coming down now. So there was, um, if I just go back a year or two, Russia's there. Ireland has a huge dip around 1848 to 1850. That's a potato famine. We can run it on just briefly. And actually, what I've done with some of this, sometimes I see a, 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 a value go down very significantly and back up again. And uh, I then look it up on Wikipedia and I can find out that it was a particular event that I did, historical event I didn't know about um, that has caused this. So um, if we just go on a couple more years, India and China go down. That's because in 1876, there was a big famine in India and China. 
if I just run on to 19. Right, so you saw there, we have 19, 11, 15, 16, 17, 19, 18. The whole world practically drops about 10 or 15 years of life expectancy. And while you might not have known what that was, if I'd asked you this question four years ago, now you'll all be able to tell me that that was the great Spanish flu, so-called pandemic of 1917 to 18 to 19, causing that particular change. So this um, particular graphic, which I will take away, hopefully you can see the screen, the, the slides again, um, is really uh, an interesting um, analysis of public health, uh, economies, the impacts on that, and he's then done some other, other really interesting graphs and visualizations that show how we can link, for example, uh, countries' development to improvements in public health, where that public health changes, typically, first of all, around maternity and uh, young babies, and, and so on, uh, so enable us to understand that in a very dynamic and, and graphic way. Another really good example of data visualization, uh, back in uh, 1900, an all-black team of analysts led by the American W.E.B. Du Bois um, did some really interesting data visualizations uh, to show the differences in uh, life outcomes for Negroes, as, as, as the black population of the United States was called at that time. That was a term used. So Negroes and whites in Georgia. And he looks at, for example, the different, uh, different uh, um, jobs that they had, um, the different um, outcomes for individuals, charts illustrating the condition of the descendants of former African slaves now resident in the United States of America. So, for example, you can see here very clearly that um, a lot, much larger proportion of Negroes, of Black, the Black Americans, um, were involved in domestic and personal service as their occupation compared to the number, proportion of whites, and similarly elsewhere. So we see um, that there are many fewer in manufacturing mechanical industries, the blue ones here. And it's quite sobering to remember that in 1900, that was just 37 years from the end of the American Civil War and the emancipation of slaves in America. So that covers what I wanted to talk about in terms of information visualization. Um, just want a little bit, oh, I keep going on too long in these, I get too carried away. So a little bit about data projection. Um, so the goal in data projection is to project data to a much lower dimensional space while preserving as much informational structure as possible. We saw an example of that when I showed you the ECG data. That was 13-dimensional data. We cannot produce a useful visualization of 13 variables at the same time. What we did was projected the data down to two dimensions, and then you could see the clustering, you could see the separation between different classes, you could see the outliers, and that visual representation is um, really helpful to understand the data. Um, we can build interactive visualization tools based on this. So this is an example of data from Pfizer. The original data is 16 dimensional, and we've projected it down to 2D using, again, a different nonlinear projection technique so that we can look at the, the data here and look at the variations in different parts of this, this space to understand that, for example, the points up here have a very low value for the first dimension, very high value for the fifth dimension, and the other, the other uh, 14 variables are all roughly about the mean, whereas in the right-hand side here, we have a very high value for the third dimension, and again, diff, um, you know, a bit, of, bit more variation in the rest of the data. This enables the scientists in Pfizer to understand the results of these screening experiments and to identify uh, types of molecule that can be useful in terms of doing drug discovery. So um, what I will do just to finish with is just do a taster for um, to show you those of you that are interested in information visualization and are going to go on to do, um, sorry, go on to, to look at the Tableau uh, workshops, uh, which are on Tuesday or Wednesday, I forget which, just to Wednesday. give you an example, sorry. Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah. thank you. To give you uh, a quick example of what can be done with Tableau, this is based on 
UK census data, uh, and it's the work of one of my MSc students for their coursework last year. So um, here we have a number of different plots that are, um, are, are, are trying to understand the UK employment landscape, uh, investigating clusters of different parts of the country, which nevertheless have a similar um, similar breakdown of the way that employment works in that part of the country. So um, there were six different types of employment that were considered in this, in this particular census data set. People who are employed, people who are self-employed, unemployed, retired, students, and inactive. Um, so what was done in this particular plot was to take those six variables and each um, local author authority area in the UK and project them down to 2D. And we end up with this projection here, two dimensions based on those six variables. And you can see that there are some quite nice clusters here. They've been color coded, um, but the color wasn't part of the original process. So we have here a cluster of data points, which are all uh, very similar in terms of employment. Now, interestingly, he's called this cluster uh, this orange cluster, um, London, because as you can, as I look through these things, you can see from the tooltip that you've got Hammersmith and Fulham, Islington, and so on. Most of these are London, but also Reading is there, and the city of Bristol. So although virtually all of those points are London, in fact, there are a few other parts of the country which are similar employment characteristics to London given by this orange blob here. So here, the city of Bristol belongs to the London uh, cluster. We then have rural areas, which are all a bit more diverse. They have cover a wider area of the map. And you might say, well, there's another subcluster here, which we could look at. And what this is doing is enabling us to see where, because these, these, these um, plots are linked, we can see how the, the points here relate to different parts of the map. And indeed, if I mouse over the map here, we can see which parts because the color coding is the same. So we have an areas of high unemployment. You can see that South Wales, sort of East Midlands, South Yorkshire, the Northeast are areas of high unemployment. These purple areas have got high employment. So they are, if you like, Middle England here. Um, the yellow points are the average urban ones. So these tend to be small, smaller, well, middle-sized towns, but also some quite large ones. So Newark and Sherwood. So the, the outskirts of large town cities, typically. Uh, Telford and Rekin is outside Stafford and so on. So we've got these, these blue ones, office, office and factory towns. So Harlow, Dartford, Gloucester, Watford, and so on. Again, often um, sort of middle-sized towns. So... This is the sort of thing that if you go to the Tableau workshop, you'll be able to build, perhaps not after one day of, of work, this is after several lab classes from me, uh, but it's a sort of really uh, highly interactive, highly visual way of representing data that enables people to um, understand that data in greater depth. And I think here are quite interesting analysis based purely on the census data of different um, uh, employment characteristics of different parts of the country. And at that point, it being 4.25, I should stop and give people a chance to ask any final questions. Apologies for mistiming that slightly. Thank you, Ian. No problem. Thanks for that brilliant presentation. I particularly enjoyed the interactive elements where we could, you know, learn on the Have spot. A go. And some really good examples of, you know, the impact of data is with that cholera um, graphic. So, yeah, really interesting. Um, we did have a question earlier on. Um, apologies for mispronouncing your name. Is it um, Kinja? Um, would you like to mute and ask your question? I'll just see if I can unmute, mute them. If they can't unmute, that's fine. I can ask the question, which was... Um, are there some nicer looking charting alternatives to bar and column charts now? So I think I would take you, yes, there are all sorts of possibilities. We've got bubble charts and so on. But I, what I would take you back to was that perceptual accuracy question. So 
if you really want people to be able to discern very fine grain differences, length is the best mechanism for doing that. You know, there have been significant amounts of psychological, psychophysical experiments that demonstrate across virtually everybody, the vast majority of people who are going to use the visualization, that, that, that length is the most the thing we perceive most accurately. Now that doesn't preclude the fact that you know impact matters as well. So grabbing people's attention by something more arresting can be useful. But often I think we want to be able to use to understand things really, really accurately. Certainly I do. Uh, and therefore I would tend to use scatter plots where where the distance matters or bar charts or line graphs as my first port of call for, for representing the data. But no, there are quite a few. And if you go and use Tableau, there's a whole raft of different things that you can you can use to represent. I think the other area is that you're not always representing a single numerical quantity. And therefore, if you wanted to represent a distribution, you might use a box and whisker plot. If you want to represent containment, you would use network graphs and so on to do that. So it does depend on the nature of the data that you're trying to, to represent as well. We've also got a, a few other questions. We've got one from Natasha, which says, have people found Tableau or Microsoft BI better by? <laughs> So uh, that's a really interesting question. I'm not an expert in, in Microsoft BI. Um, I know it's used a lot in industry. Um, one of the reasons why I use Tableau in my teaching and therefore use it for other things as well is that it is um, free for use for, as an academic license for teaching. So it means I can give it to all my students for them to use on the coursework and to learn on the, the unit, whereas there is no academic license from Microsoft BI. The university does not have a license, but certainly not for teaching, and therefore it's $35 a month. Um, I think I'd be mu I'm much more popular for using Tableau for that very reason. So I'm afraid I'm not expert in Microsoft BI. I believe it has similar facilities to Tableau, um, but I, I'm, I don't know it so well. Yeah, and I should mention if you come along to the Tableau session, you will get that license. You can download also for free onto your machine. Um, however, someone asked, will it be recorded? No, those will not be recorded, unfortunately, because they're in-person sessions. But if you look on our website at last year's sessions, those have been recorded and they're similar to these this year's ones. Um, we've also got another question from Will. Um, you've spoken a lot about making visualization more effective. Mm -hmm. What should we look out for to see when people may be trying to mislead us with data visualization? Um, yeah, so it's important to be skeptical. Um, so there are a number of things to look out for. There's a, there's a wonderful book written God, back in the 60s, I think, by someone called Daryl Huff, which was called, had the most brilliant title, which is How to Lie with Statistics. And that contains a lot of the tricks around the way people uh, talk about data or, or or use data. So so it's really critical to look carefully at axes, for example. So if axes don't have labels, then you don't know where they start from. You don't know where they represent. So the great example is of um, uh, axes which don't have, you think they're starting from zero and they don't, which can make a big difference to how significant a change might appear. Um, the other thing to look out for is where people use graphics. So if they don't use lines or bars, if they do a two-dimensional object, then if the area represents um, uh, the value, we're going to misunderstand, we're going to, you know, the, our perception of that is, is not linear, as I said. So we're going to probably underestimate changes in area and how big an effect, how big a representation, the, the underlying variable is, that they represent. Sorry, I didn't explain that very well. But you know, if an area doubles, we perceive that as growing by less than double. So therefore, we underestimate the the size changes when they're represented by areas rather than by by lines and distances. So I think one of the things to look for is if people aren't using standard techniques, to be aware of the fact that you might not perceive differences uh, as as much or might over perceive the differences because they're using those non-standard methods. Yeah, yeah. And we've also got a question from Mary. Are there resources speaking on best practices for data visualization or making accessible data visualizations? 
So accessibility is a really good question, and there is a very good resource for that, which I give to my students, which I will just briefly um, look up, if I may. Yeah, sure. And while you look that up, I'll also add that uh, the Jean Golding Institute runs a data visualization club or group where we highlight best practice. So um, that might be something you'd be interested in attending. Yeah. Or going to. Um, so it's, it's called Chartability. So if you look for Chartability online, that has a wonderful resource. It's um it's got a worksheet for you to work through um for individual charts to to assess how how accessible they are. I should say it's like much academic research. People get carried away by the the importance of what they're working on. Apparently, it takes 45 minutes to work through that worksheet for each chart you're doing. And I'm thinking that's probably a bit more, bit of overkill. But there are, there's a smaller subset of the things that they suggest you look at, but it's certainly well worth um, investigating. In terms of general guidance, um, Tamara Munzner's book is great, but it is a book. But if you're in part of the university, there is a, an electronic version of it available. Uh, and that does have some, some good... Um, very detailed guidance, but there's also 10 rules of thumb that she provides that are a very good starting point. So, for example, to, uh, to use 2D in preference to 3D, and this is a very good reason for using 3D visualization, to get it right in black and white. So as far as possible, to not use color to represent data and other things of that sort, which are very, a very, very good checklist just in terms of making sure you're you, yeah, using some good principles at the underpinning of your, your visualizations. Right. Are you okay to stay on for another couple of questions? Yep, I can indeed. Okay, brilliant. So we've got one from Freddie. Do any special considerations have to be made for visualization, uh, visualizing time series data? For example, is using data production methods such as T-SNE valid if each consecutive point is just considered as a dimension, or is this misleading regarding correlations between the points in time? So um, that's a very good question. So TSNE, um, as you saw, is something I, I teach and that people people use on in their in their their coursework. Um, so the way so typically, if a time series is for a single variable, it doesn't make sense to use data projection for each value. But what you can do is provide context. So um, I don't want to get too technical online, but you can use what's called embedding methods. So what you do is you take a window of past values and there are ways of uh, machine learning methods of determining how large that window should be. So instead of taking a single data point, say I can take the data point and it's five or 10 previous values. You do that for every point in the time series. So that gives you um, a time series of five or let's say five dimensional data points. That is what you would then project down and that would give you a visualization of the data and the time course that it goes through. The other thing that you might be doing on time series data, which I, I didn't get onto, is um, uh, this, <laughs> this example here, the Augusta Westland example, where we had time series measurements of eight sensors. We took each sensor individually and we did a fast Fourier transform. So it's a different way of giving the context of a data point. So each data point becomes every half second interval, we do a fast Fourier transform, which gives us a whole spectrum of frequency responses. And that then becomes something that we then embed. And that I did here. So this is a two dimensional representation of each data point, where each data point was about 60 different frequency uh, bands of power. So um, about the 60 dimensions down to two, and um, here we have a nice way of separating out different parts of a what's a flight path or a helicopter, but you can see the different colors here represent different elements, different parts of that flight. So it did give a genuinely interesting visualization of the data. So what you do is you do the pre-processing to, to give the context for each data point, whether it's through a, a frequency transform or through a, an embedding, and then you would do a projection of that data. 
Thanks, Ian. I think we're going to have to wrap it up there as um, we've already five minutes over, but thank you so much for your brilliant presentation and for your answers. It's been really interesting and I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as I have. And thank you to the audience for attending and to Elaine and then to Zah for helping it behind the scenes. Um, please do fill in our feedback form. It does really help us improve um you know the quality of events for uh, the next round of events and um yeah thank you all thank you again ian really enjoyed it thank you for the invitation Yara. have a good afternoon everyone and we'll see you soon take care Bye.